Good morning. If you have your Bibles, we're going to turn to the 23rd Psalm. Familiar, everybody knows this one, maybe able to say it by heart from the King James, probably, but we're going to read it from the ESV this morning, and if you're able to stand for the reading of God's Word, please do so. <clears throat> the 23rd Psalm, the Psalm of David. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Would you bow with me in prayer? Father, we do thank you for this amazing psalm, letting us, <coughs> excuse me, letting us know that you're there with us in the rough times, in the good times, in the hurting times. But we need to follow you as our shepherd, that you will not lead us astray. And we thank you for that promise that you give us in this psalm. We thank you that you will never abandon us when we turn to you. And Lord, we praise you for being able to come here this morning and, and give worship to you for those reasons, just for those reasons that you are here to save us, you love us, and you have given your life for us. And we thank you and praise you that you have given your life to save us from our sins, that we can call on you and your promises are true. So Father, as we go into this morning's worship, time just bring our thoughts into captivity that for the next little while we can focus completely and wholly upon what it is you have for us each one here today and we ask lord that you would speak to each one of us draw us to yourself in a way that you never have before lead us beside still waters we thank you praise you and give you the glory in jesus precious name and all god's people said Amen. You may be seated. All right. Well, our April memory verse, John 6, 29, Jesus answered him, This is the work of God that you believe in him whom he has sent. This is the work of God that you believe in him whom he has sent. Okay, immediately following service today, we have our quarterly business meeting. Uh, we hope that you will join us for that. Uh, come and have lunch with us. We'd love to see you and uh, hear what's going on with the, in the church and what's, what, what's being planned. We've got a new member to vote in. We're excited about that. So immediately following service today, just head right over there. At the end, Dave will pray for the food whether he knows it or not, and <laughs> he does now. Um, so join us next door uh, for fellowship and food and a business meeting. The, on the back table, there's some flyers for the Operation Christmas Child uh, box that's back there. We're collecting items. This, for the month of April, is toys. For the shoe boxes last month was hats, gloves, and socks. Um, if you would remember, if you want to bring something in for the shoe box, when we, when we put shoe boxes together, uh, we'll use items that we collect uh, throughout uh, this month and next month. Also on the back table, there is a update, a missions update from Robert Newhall. Uh, about what's going on, some prayer needs, and what he's been doing, what he's doing now. Um, so grab one of those, read what's going on with him. The outreach breakfast is on the 20th. This month is pancakes. 
So April 20th, mark that on your calendar. Come have a free breakfast, free hot breakfast. And then immediately following the breakfast, there will be at 2 to 5 o'clock, well, not immediately following, but breakfast ends at 11, but from 2 to 5, there's a town hall meeting here for all the events that are happening in the community. Uh, last month, the mayor and city council and uh, state representatives were here answering questions about all, oh, there's a lot of stuff going on in this community uh, with the school bond and new housing developments and road changes and roundabouts being put in. There's all kinds of stuff going on. And if you want to be in the know about what's going on or ask some questions that aren't allowed in City Hall. In City Hall, you've only got a brief amount of time to ask a question. The questions have to be submitted prior. Here's more of an open forum. So for three hours, you'll be able to ask the city government and even some, some I don't know who's going to be here, but even state government, our representatives uh, will be here. So uh, if, if that's your thing, you want to know what's been going on with the city, in the city, um, come to the town hall meeting on April 20th from 2 to 5. And then on the 28th will be our game night. We'll have bunco night on the 28th. So join us for that <coughs> if you want to come for that. A um, couple birthdays this week. Well, today is Brittany. She's not here. And then Annette Oliver is on the 19th. So happy birthday to those two. Are there any other announcements? Um, one other thing, the VBS, there's papers on the back to sign up for things to do at the VBS. Uh, look over those things, and if you want to help out in a particular area, uh, put your name down, and Jamie will come and twist your arm about getting that done. Um, any other announcements? All right. Anybody have a testimony? Anything you want to share about what God's been doing in your life? Right up front. Miss Debbie. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Um, I have a little update on our little lady who's living with us, who has been now for a little bit over a year, Anna Marie. I know that some of you have been praying for her as we do daily. Um, she got a new job to supplement the other job that she had already in housekeeping at Collins Retreat. And now she's doing kitchen work and hostessing, which is a big step for her because she is, has kind of uh, not been able to, she doesn't know how to talk to people very well if they're outside of her um, homeboys. Let's put it that way. Um, so we continue to pray. She's like a daughter to us, the child that we never could have. And, um, and even though she just turned 38, we're kind of going through a little bit of a spell. So pray for John and I too, because this has been a, a bumpy ride and a big learning experience. But I give all the glory for her just making these steps by leaps and bounds, it seems. And we're so excited for her future. Thank you, Jesus. Anyone else? All right. If there's none other, then we're going to ask Dave and the worship team to come and lead us in a few songs this morning.
Hide my soul. the still, still waters. His goodness restores my soul.
taking those chains away that were binding us. 
Lord, we lived our lives before you doing the best we could, but Jesus, it's not just doing the best, it's knowing you as Lord and Savior, and I thank you, Jesus. It's, you've called us to yourself. You want none to perish. And I pray, Lord, this morning, if anybody has not heard that call or not responded to that call, I pray, Jesus, that you would just open the eyes of their heart. They'd hear and respond to you. Thank you, Jesus. Speak mindedly through our brother, Pastor Wally. Give him the words, Lord, that we need to hear to be that people you want us to be. We praise you, Jesus. Amazing grace, how great the sound. Thank you, Jesus, for your love. We pray these things in your name and all God's people said, amen. amen. Please be seated. Any kids want to come up? All right. Hi. I'm glad you guys are here today. All right. So I want to, you know what these are? What are these things? Life jackets. That's right. Have you ever been on a boat? Yeah. And what, are the, what does the kids have to wear when they're on a boat? A life, a life jacket. Why do you have to wear a life jacket? So you don't drown. Yeah, so you don't drown. But what, what, if you're in the boat, hopefully you won't drown, right? But what happens? Why, do you, why would you have to wear a life jacket? Yes, yeah, so you don't have to drown, or you wouldn't drown, but what else? If the boat sank, or you fell out of the boat, right? That's what the life jacket's for, right? That's why you wear it in case something happens, right? What does a life jacket do? How does it do that? It makes you float on top of the water so somebody can find you, right? So you don't, <coughs> excuse me, so you don't sink. Do you guys know how to swim? Are you good swimmers? How about you girls? Do you know how to swim? Scarlett know, doesn't know how to swim yet? You kind of do? Well, that's good. Good start. Swimming's a good thing to learn how to do. So you think you're a good swimmer? In the middle, you're an okay swimmer. All right. Have you ever tried to just float on top of the water? <laughs> no, yeah? <laughs> Does it work very good? Oh, okay. It's not easy. I mean, you can do it. Some people sink like a rock. Some people can't float at all. I used to know a guy that you get in any kind of water, he'd sink. Now, there's a, there's a sea in, in Israel. It's called the Dead Sea, and it's got lots of salt in it. And you, you can't sink in it. it. You float right on top of the water really easily. So we're going to hear a story today about Jesus and how he walked on water. Can you imagine that? You think you could walk on water? No. No, you couldn't walk on top of water. It'd be a really hard thing to do. But he's, he, we're going to hear a story about how Jesus walked across a lake and saved the disciples that were in a boat. They were, they were, they were, and it says in the Bible that they were afraid in John chapter 6. And it says they were out in this boat and the storm came up and they were really afraid because they were rowing and rowing and rowing and they didn't get anywhere. They rowed for hours and they couldn't get across the lake and the wind kept blowing them back and they didn't know what they were doing. And it says they were getting really, really afraid. And they were afraid that the boat might sink or get blown over. Yeah, there was a whole bunch of guys in the boat and they were worried about it. But we don't have to be afraid of things that can happen to us when we have Jesus as our life jacket. Amen. Okay? But what's the thing about a life jacket? What, is, what, is a, what saves you about that life jacket if you were in the boat? So I get the boat sinks and I get the pressure like a boat and kind of set to 
Okay, well, that could happen. But what's the most important thing about a life jacket? It makes you float, but there's one thing that's more important than that. You have to wear it. <laughs> if you don't wear the life jacket, it can't help you, can it? No, you have to put it on, and that's just like with Jesus. We have to have Jesus in our lives or he, he can't help us. We have to have him. We have to call on him to come into our life to save us. He saves us from our sin. And that's so important why we have to wear Jesus every day. Put him on just like a life jacket. What's a parachute for? Okay, skydive. What's the most important thing about a parachute? Okay, but there's one other thing that's more important than that. You got to put it on. That's right. You can, you can have a parachute and you can see it sitting there and you say, boy, that's a really good idea, but I'm going to take my chances and just jump. Probably not going to make it, right? But if you put the parachute on, it may not be comfortable. You know, like, so if I put this... If I put this life jacket on right now, oh. this, is, this is my life jacket. It, it inflates on its own. So if I put my life jacket on, somehow here, there we go. It might not be comfortable. And everybody around the room might say, boy, that's stupid. Why are you wearing a life jacket now? But if you were in an airplane and you had a parachute on, you know, it'd be really hard to sit in your seat. It might be uncomfortable. But if you had to jump out of the plane, it would save you, right? Yeah. That's why Jesus is like. You have to put him on. You have to wear him everywhere you go. And so he can save you and help you. And that's what the story about is about today. How Jesus saved all the disciples in the boat, right? But we have to have Jesus in our life and... He, so he can save us. All right? That makes sense? Yes. All right. Thank you guys for coming. All right, you're ready. <laughs> I wasn't quite sure how I was going to transition to put this on, but that worked. Just nobody come and pull the yellow handle, okay? <laughs> don't, don't do it. I don't want to inflate. All right, so today this is the 24th message in our series of the Gospel of John, the Divine Authority of Jesus. Today, the title of today's message is A Shelter in a Time of Storm. A Shelter in a Time of Storm. So before we jump into this, let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have given us Jesus as the ultimate life jacket. That you save us from the storms of life and you save us from our sin. And Lord, we thank you that you have given us this picture of how you can save us. We thank you, Lord, and ask that you would speak to each one of us here. And may your Holy Spirit move among us freely and draw us to yourself in a way that you never have before. We ask, Lord, that your presence would be felt. And, that, Lord, that you would go before us and draw us to yourself again. We pray for the events of the day, the business meeting to come. We pray that our thoughts would be honoring and glorifying to you. And right now, we just ask that you would draw our thoughts into captivity. That our focus would be completely and wholly upon what it is you have for each one of us here individually and corporately as a church. We give you the praise, honor, and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. <clears throat> so last week, we're, in, we're going to be in John chapter 6 again. And like I said last week, we're going to be in John chapter 6 for a while. It's uh, 71 verses long. Today we're going to be from verse 16 to 21. And uh, today is about, like I said with the kids, it's about uh, 
this miracle of Jesus walking on the water. Last week was about a miracle of Jesus, how he fed 5,000 people, plus women and children, with five loaves of bread and two fish. And when they were done, they collected 12 basketfuls of leftovers when they were done from two, five loaves of bread and two fish. Dean and I went to the coast this last week, and when we got home, we were unloading the trailer, and, and uh, I said, I, I don't remember bringing this much food. And Dina said, well, it's 12 baskets full of leftovers. <laughs> God multiplied what we took, and I don't know how it happened, but we wound up with more food coming home than we went with, plus, plus the clams. But anyway, that's, that's another story. Last week was about the endless all-you-can-eat fish and bread. Jesus supplied an endless amount of nourishment, of food for the people. He knew their needs. People perish in flash floods, disasters, all the time. In Israel, there's deep ravines cut in the sides of the mountains where water rushes down. They're called wadis, W-A-D-I. And it's where there's flash floods happen instantly. They take out everything in their path. Roads, last time we were there, we were traveling down the road towards Elot, and there was uh, some of the roads had been washed out. And they repair them as fast as they can. The ground can't absorb all the water that when the rain hits, the water can't be absorbed into the ground, and it has to go somewhere. So it runs downhill. The, the, uh, the Dead Sea, the, uh, that rift in the valley there is... Uh, in some places nearly a thousand feet below sea level. So that water rushes downhill and, and cuts these big ravines into, into, the, into the land. Now when we read the 23rd Psalm, that is what David is writing about in that Psalm. He's talking about how not to get caught in one of those ravines when the floods came. So you don't get washed away. And as he says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. The waters coming down those mountains are anything but still. They're a torrent and they take everything out in front of them. He says, he restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though, okay, so picture David is a, is a shepherd and he's shepherding sheep around, and, and once in a while they've got to cross one of these ravines. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you want to get through this, you want to get to the other side as fast as possible so you don't get washed away. They call them shadows of death because you never know when it's coming. Flash floods are instantaneous. I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. So us like sheep, the rod and the staff is what helps get us through, guides us, directs us, protects us. Not only are they items for correction, they're weapons against evil. So that's what the, the picture of the 23rd Psalm is. God leads us through these hard times, these hard things in our lives. In 1903, after three days of torrential rain in Hepner, Hepner, Oregon, the, the nearby creeks began to swell. They actually began to rise quite a bit above, above flood stage, and, the, and they were washing down debris. There was two creeks there, Balm Fork and, and Hinton Creek, and they, they converge together. And at that convergence, there was a, a dam from all of the trees and all of the debris that had collected, and it built up a wall of water behind those two creeks. And they kept rising and rising and rising until the dam broke. 
when the dam finally broke, all of that water had to go somewhere, and it went into Willow Creek. Willow Creek went through Hebner. In 1903, everybody was sitting down for dinner, and a wall of water came through the town. 247 people that they know of lost their lives as they were eating dinner. Their houses were swept away. Some of them never found. They, there's estimates as many as 500 people may have perished out of a city of 1,900. Nearly a third of the people may have perished. That's a, that's a big number. Because this torrential rain came through. So this is the point of that illustration. There are things in life, there are things that we go through that are out of our control. We cannot control nature. No matter how much we stress about it, no matter how much we prepare, there are things that are going to happen to us in our lives that we just don't prepare for. We just can't. If we knew the future, we would probably curl up in a ball and hide. There's many things that we go through that we can be afraid of. Think about all the craziness going on in the world. And we talk about all the time in the news and this and that and the conspiracy theories and whatnot. And it drives us crazy and we rack our brains about what's going to happen next. It's out of our control. Amen. No matter how much you worry about it, it's not going to change the outcome. So we have to give it to God. Jesus Put on that life jacket and let him walk you through it. We can be afraid of a lot of things, but we, can't, we should not be afraid of God. We should, not fear, we should not be afraid of him, but we should fear him. And there's a difference between fear and being afraid. That fear of God is an awe a respect of what he is and who he is and the power that he has. We, we must have a reverent awe of God's power and his power over nature. And the story this morning is about that. Jesus' command over nature and how we should be in awe of what he has done for us. Even though there's things in nature that cause danger for us, God is in control. It may not seem like it to us, and we're here, and there's things that happen to us, but that doesn't mean that God isn't in control. He doesn't take us out of every dangerous thing, and he lets us go things, but go through things, but that doesn't mean God is not in control. He's not a puppet master and keeping us safe from everything. But one thing God does for us is he wants to save us from the one thing that will keep us eternally out of heaven. And that's our sins. And that's why Jesus went to the cross. To pay the one-time sacrifice for our sins. The sacrifice that before that had to be kept up and maintained through the sacrifice of animals, Jesus did it once for all. No more sacrifice. He did it all. He took, the, he took my sin and yours and he paid the price. The heavy price. So today we're, we're not going to center on trying to figure out this miracle that Jesus did when he walked on the water. That's that's not really what we're going to focus on. We're going to, we're going to talk about it. We're going to turn our attention to what Jesus offers while standing on the water. What does He offer you and I? What did He offer the disciples when He walked out to their boat? 
I'd be remiss if I, if I didn't say Jesus has command over nature, but yet He has physical limitations just like you and I. I don't understand that. How, how He can have physical limitations and live within the, the bounds of nature yet have command over nature at the same time. I'm not smart enough to understand that. One day I might know. But I know it's true because Scripture says it's true. And Jesus proves it in this miracle. He proves His command over nature and everything in it in this one miracle. Jesus not only lived within the bounds or the perimeters of our existence, He showed command over them. He got hungry. He got tired. He got thirsty. He was sad. He got angry. He got sleepy. Just like you and I. He did those things just like we do. Yet unexplainably, he was able to walk on the top of water during a storm. Like being able to walk on dry land, he walked across water. So our verses today on this, this miracle of Jesus walking on the water are only six verses long. Not much attention John gives this miracle. Six verses from chapter 6, verse 16 through 21. Beginning in verse 16. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat, and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat. And they were frightened. But he said to them, It is I. Do not be afraid. And then they were glad to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at the land to which they were going. Now this miracle is repeated in the Gospel of Matthew in chapter 14 and the Gospel of Mark in chapter 6. They give it a little more attention than John does, but not a lot. So the question we always have to ask ourselves when we read any kind of Scripture is why is this important to me today? Why does this matter to me today? There are many things that people seemingly do to keep from coming to a saving relationship with Jesus. An overview of those things that are pictured in different ways throughout Scripture. Scripture tells us there are things that keep us in our own minds from a saving relationship. We make up excuses. And one of those is in our text this morning. And it paints a picture of salvation. This, this, this miracle of Jesus walking on the water actually is a synopsis for salvation. Everyone needs to be saved. But not everybody wants to be saved. Just like the boat going across the Sea of Galilee, it was Jesus that saved them, not the boat. They were afraid. They were scared. They were, they were afraid they were going to die. Jesus saved them, not the boat. Amen. What's the point? Jesus will save you 
not the life jacket. Jesus will save you, not the church. Jesus will save you, not the amount of good gospel music you listen to. Jesus will save you, not anything else you do. It is Jesus that saves you. But you got to put him on. He's got to be in your life. You've got to wear him everywhere because you never know when the dam will burst and the flood will come through your life and tear everything apart. Scripture tells us that that's going to happen. David, that's what that, that psalm is about. The, the, un, the things that are unplanned in our lives. And looking and wearing Jesus, wearing the Lord all the time. Looking to Him for hope. So this morning is not just about a miracle that Jesus did and His command over, over nature. It's that, but it's also a picture of salvation. And that's my big idea for this morning. And there's four things on how Jesus, how is Jesus walking on water a picture of salvation. And the first is a life without Jesus. A life without Jesus. From chapter 6, verse 16 and 17 again. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat, and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. Have you ever tried to navigate a boat? I know Chuck has. Have you ever tried to navigate a boat at night? Anybody? That's a, it's a very difficult thing. It's not like driving down the road with your headlights on and you can see lines on where to go and where to turn. There are no lines and there are no markers. You can see only a little bit in front of you, if at all. And if it's foggy or windy or rainy, you, you don't know what direction you're going. Modern ships are equipped with electronics and, and things to help them navigate through storms. And even though they can't see what's going on or what's out in front of them at, at, in the dark, the electronics are there to help them. And it has been for a long time. And there's been instru instruments on boats for centuries, millennia. Navigating by the stars or compasses and things, things of that nature. The modern ships, the, the bridge is, is no longer called a bridge. It's called a command center. And it looks like the USS Enterprise, the Star Trek command center. It's, there's not steering wheels. There's joysticks and knobs and buttons. And that's how they navigate these ships. There's lights. Ships have lights and every ship has to have on the left a red light and on the right a green light and on the back a white light. Every ship has to have those. And so you can know if you're looking at a ship which side, which way it's going. When they enter the Columbia River, we were just down there and every ship that enters the Columbia River has to have a pilot. And they take a helicopter out from Astoria. It's a yellow helicopter. And you can see it every time it goes out. They fly a man out to a ship. They drop him off on the ship and he navigates the ship into safe harbor. That's by state law. Many... Many bars across the country and many bays have the same thing. And these pilots have to know the maps and the navigation and the channels, and they have to do it without looking. They it all has to be right here. They're amazing people. Anyway, these ships are amazing, the navigation that they have. Now imagine getting into a boat that's probably, be at, probably about 15 or 20 feet long, 10 or 12 people in it. It's almost night. 
and you're rowing across the lake. It becomes dark. And then a storm comes up. And the point is this. Without someone to guide the ship, without someone to know where you're going or how to navigate that ship, we get lost. We would be lost. When we get on a cruise ship, we put our confidence into the captain of that ship that, and the crew that they know how to get us where we need to go. We trust them. We trust them to navigate safely rough waters. We trust them with our lives. Now let's put this into perspective. Jesus serves lunch to 5,000 people plus women and children, right? Five loaves of bread, two fish, 12 basketfuls left over. These crowds are so taken by what Jesus just did, they're trying to follow him everywhere he goes. <clears throat> they get done, they see this great thing he, he has done, and they decide, we're going to make him our king. This is so wonderful, we want more of this. We want some more handouts. Bring them on. We could live like this. They plan to seize him and make him king and Jesus runs off up onto a mountain to get away from him. From John chapter 6, verse 14 and 15, we see that. It says, when the people saw the sign that he had done, the feeding of the 5,000, when they saw that and they, they understood what he did, in verse 15 says, Jesus withdrew again to a mountain by himself. He got out of the place and got away from the crowd so they couldn't take him by force and make him king. Now verse 16 is really interesting because it starts out with when evening came, his disciples went down to the sea. That means it's the same day. The same day as Jesus fed the 5,000 happened to be the day he walked on water as well. Two miracles, one day. I think it's fascinating. I don't know about you, but when the storms of life come, and they will, who will you turn to? Who is the captain of your ship? Or are you trusting yourself to row yourself to safety? Are you letting Jesus take the wheel, so to speak? See, that's part of our problem is we think we've got to navigate this life on our own and we've got to do it in our own power. A life without Jesus is a life that is certainly going to have trouble. Maybe not in this life, but in the next. Jesus says, without a saving faith, faith, there will be certain destruction. And that's what I was just talking about. This, this saving faith is, keeps us from the condemnation that we have. John chapter 3, verse 18 says, whoever believes in him is not condemned. That word means to be punished or sentenced for something. But whoever does not believe is condemned already. So those who don't have Jesus in the boat with them are already condemned. They're already going to sink. Is Jesus in our boat? What crime have we committed? The crime is called sin. It isn't any one thing. It's sin. 
Sin is a crime against God. And we are not perfect. We have all sinned and we all fall short of the glory of God. You, me, all of us. We cannot save ourselves. Unless Jesus is in our boat, we are doomed. We are condemned already. Whoever has the Son of God in a saving faith is saved. Whoever does not have the Son of God in a saving faith, the punishment of God remains on us. It's our choice. God does not choose people to go to hell. We do that on our own. We can choose to get out or choose to remain. That is our choice. So what choice do you make? John 3.36 tells us that whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, and if you don't, the wrath of God remains. Remains. It means it's already there. It doesn't come upon you. It's already there. It's up to us to get rid of it. Put the life jacket on. Put Jesus on. Let him save you from the storm that's going to come. You might say, well, but I believe in Jesus. That's good. But that's not good enough. You've got to put the life jacket on in order for it to work. I believe in those life jackets over there and I believe that they can save somebody. But if somebody is not wearing that life jacket, they will die or drown. You've got to put it on. James 2.19 says, you believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe. And they shudder. They're shaking in their boots. They know God is real. They know His power, but they're choosing themselves not to have a saving faith. Saving faith is more than just belief. The demons believe in God and they're not going to heaven. It takes some action on our part. It means we've got to put Jesus on. We've got to prepare for the things that are ahead and, and sometimes the life jacket might be uncomfortable. People in public might say, well, why are you wearing that crazy thing? What do you think that's going to do for you? How is this Jesus stuff going to put food on your table? Right? Putting on Jesus may come with criticism. It may come with condemnation from the world, but if we don't have it, the life jacket on, where are we? Simultaneously with belief, we have to put that life jacket on, confessing our sins to Jesus, letting Him save us. This Jesus' disciples are a picture of in this boat of life traveling without Jesus. See, they got in the boat and they headed out across the lake. Jesus isn't in the boat. The storm comes along and they're terrified. They're headed for certain destruction. Without Jesus, it is an uncertain future. So how is Jesus walking on water a picture of salvation? Well, it's a life without Jesus, a life struggling without hope. In verses 18 and 19, the sea became rough because of a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed out about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat. <coughs> and they were frightened. So I want you to notice something. 
It says in verse 18, the sea became rough. It wasn't rough when they got in the boat. They had easy sailing. They were rowing out across the lake. Everything was good. They were headed to Capernaum. No problems. Normally takes them half hour, 45 minutes maybe to row across the lake. A few miles. They had it. Then a wind comes up. And they're rowing against the wind and, and things are getting rough and they start struggling. There's an uncertainty of what's happening and the, and the sea is getting rough and the waves are getting higher. Down on the Sea of Galilee, it's 700 feet below sea level. And the winds come over the mountains down directly onto the lake and they stir it up. There can be really large waves. When Dean and I were down to the coast this last week, three, three of the days we were there, you couldn't see the horizon because of the size of the waves. They were huge. There were 20, 30 foot waves out there and you couldn't see past. But Friday, this, it calmed down and you could see the horizon. And I told Dean, I said, boy, this, there's almost no waves out there. It's such a drastic change. Things change so fast and and it's a picture of our lives and how things can come up and get rough so easily. They rode three or four miles against the wind. And they were struggling. They weren't getting anywhere. They'd row a mile and get blown back a mile and row a mile and get blown back a mile. Isn't that a picture of our lives sometimes? It seems like the struggles that we're in, the things that we go through, seem like it's so hard to row. It takes such an effort. And then suddenly things can go haywire all of a sudden. Things seem like they're going smoothly. But think about this, them men in that boat rowing across the lake at night. The wind's blowing. The waves are crashing over the front of the boat. They can't see the hope they have until Jesus appears. Without Jesus, there's no eternal hope. We're just hoping in ourselves. We're hoping to row ourselves there. And no matter how hard we row, we don't get anywhere until Jesus comes into our life. Sure, we can limp by in life without Jesus. Some, some people don't feel they need Jesus. Things are just great. They have no storms. But there is a storm on the horizon coming for everyone who does not know Jesus. Maybe not in this lifetime will they have a storm, but in the one to come, there will be. They have people have everything they need until death comes. So without Jesus on our boat, which is a, it's a metaphor for our life, when it comes to salvation, it's, it's like rowing against the wind. The wind isn't just a, a breeze. It's a gale force wind. It's a hurricane. Are you rowing against the wind in a storm? Is that what it feels like? We can have hope. In the middle of the storm, in the middle of those things going in on in our lives, we can have hope if Jesus is in sight. Amen. In about 25 years ago, Dean and I went on a fishing trip to, in Mexico, in Cabo San Lucas. We went, uh, one day we wanted to go tuna fishing. So we, we got on a chartered boat and we went out about 30 miles. And we were tuna fishing. We caught lots of tuna fish, big ones. And 
when I left, I had a GPS with me, and I had, when I left Cabo, I plugged it in, I was just playing with it, see how fast we were going, where we were going, what, what not, and I stuck it in my pocket. And we were out there fishing, and a storm blew in. The waves become very high, and the sea, or the sky became dark. It started to rain, and I could hear the captain up on the flying bridge, and he was talking, I don't know what he was saying, in Spanish to the other captains in the area, the other charter boats. And then he, he yelled down to me, hey, amigo, can I see your GPS? Can you give me a heading back to Cabo? So I got my GPS and I told him the, the degrees north. See, he had a compass. He knew how to go north or east or west or south. But he didn't know whether to go northwest or northeast. He couldn't see the horizon. He couldn't see land anymore. He was lost. So I gave him a bearing and he turned the boat towards the compass and the degrees on the compass and I'm here today because of my GPS. <laughs> and he got on the radio and he told the other captains with a, the GPS heading and everyone made it back to Cabo safe. We can struggle not knowing where we're at, not knowing what direction to go. The point is this. Without Jesus, our struggle with sin is hopeless and without direction. Amen. Jesus is that true north. Remember that in our, uh, the gender class we did? True north is Jesus. It's not magnetic north. True north will get you to Jesus. Magnetic north will get you lost. Jesus has to be true north. So set your compass to Jesus. And you know what GPS stands for, right? God's plan of salvation. <laughs> so when you think about GPS... It's God's plan of salvation that saves us. Not the boat, not yourselves, Jesus. God's plan of salvation. So how is Jesus walking on water a picture of salvation? A life without Jesus, a life struggling without hope, a life without fear. From verse 20. But he said to them, it is I. Do not be afraid. As I said, there are struggles that we are going to go through in life. They are inevitable. They are unavoidable. Whether it be physical, whether it be medical, health issues, family issues, strained relationships. Those are all things that we have in our, our lives that we struggle with. We're going to have them. Things happen. Life happens. But we're in that boat rowing against the wind. It seems like everything is going against us. It seems like we're not getting any headway. We can't see how this Jesus thing is helping me at all. I said a prayer and I hope it's good. What I want to remind you of today is if you said that prayer and it came from your heart and you put Jesus on, if you're wearing him today as your life jacket, keep rowing. Don't stop rowing. The struggle is always there. Don't give up. God is not going to abandon you. 
No matter what you're going through in your life, he is there. He knows your struggle. It doesn't mean he's going to remove all the bad things in our lives. He knows, he cares, and he wants us to look to him. He wants us to read his word, to to get closer to him, to pray to him, be in fellowship with other believers. Sometimes things we go through seem overwhelming. Because if Jesus is guiding you, there's nothing to be afraid of. These things that take our focus and our minds off of Jesus, they're not the things to be afraid of. We make them the things to be afraid of, certainly. We worry about things. How we were having, this isn't on the test, Dave. <laughs> this morning I come in, I, I normally I turn everything on and get it. Well, the com- both computers back there had an update to do. See, I hadn't been here all this last week, and normally I get everything ready for today. Well, I come in this morning, well, the com- both computers came up and said an update, Windows update had to happen. It's like, oh, great. So the Jasmine's computer back there, I, I got it going. It went pretty fast. Walter's computer, it kept going and going. We got here at 8 by about 9.30ish, it got done. I was getting worried that you guys weren't going to have anything behind me. I went next door, I sat down, and I prayed, God, you got to fix this computer, please. Come back over, and it was on. So I'm giving him the praise for that. I don't, you know, it's okay. Uh, Keep rowing. Is Jesus just in sight of your boat? Is Jesus out there walking on the water and you can see him? Or or is he at the helm? Is he at the controls? And that means you're letting him drive. That means you've put him on and you're trusting him with your life. <clears throat> He'll never steer you wrong. Amen. It may seem like things are going crazy sometimes. It may not seem like he knows the direction we need to go. But he's never going to abandon us. He's never going to sink the ship. Is Jesus your captain? Or is he just standing out there and we're looking at him? What are we afraid of? The storm? If you've asked Jesus already to save you, if you've already made that confession of faith, if you've Ask Jesus to come into your life, forgive you of your sins. You've confessed your sins to him, admitted your sins, believe that he is the Savior. He's in the boat with you. He offers us salvation. He gives us the life jacket to when we die, when we die, we will be saved. Without the life jacket, there's no hope. We will, we will drown. So why not let Jesus take control of your life today? What's holding you back? Amen. If you're listening online, what's holding you back today? What's keeping you from letting Jesus in your boat to save you? What's keeping you from putting him on and wearing him publicly? Are you scared of ridicule, criticism? Worried about losing some friends, relatives, loved ones? 
Jesus did all of that. He lost all of those. For you, for me. We don't have it too bad. In fact, we've got it pretty easy. He'll never abandon ship. He will always steer us to still waters. So how is, a, how is Jesus walking on water a picture of salvation? A life without Jesus, <clears throat> a life struggling without hope, a life without fear, and now a, a life with a future and a hope. From chapter 6, verse 21. Then they were glad to take him into the boat. And immediately the boat was at the land to which they were going. Jesus' disciples have been rowing for three to four hours. Rowing in place, not going anywhere, maybe going backwards and making a couple strokes forward and basically rowing and going nowhere. They were struggling without hope and they were getting fearful. The storm was getting stronger and stronger. Suddenly Jesus appears. He's walking on the water. He says, it is I. Do not be afraid. And picture Jesus standing on the water. He's out in front of our boat. He says, don't be afraid. Both Matthew and Mark record the, the disciples, what they thought when they saw Jesus. Both Matthew and Mark say that the disciples thought they saw a ghost at first. They didn't recognize him at first. How could somebody be walking on the water? It, it must be a ghost. Once they knew it was Jesus, they had hope. Once you heard the word of salvation, you have had hope. It's up to you to accept it or reject it. Now here's the amazing part of this miracle. Jesus walking on the water, and I don't want you to miss this. Once Jesus got into the boat... They were safe. The text says they were immediately at land. He got in the boat and they were saved. They didn't have to jump through the hoops. They didn't have to put life jackets on. They didn't have to keep rowing. They were instantly there. When you put Jesus on, when Jesus is your life jacket, you are instantly safe. It means you don't take him off. It means he's, you wear him wherever you are. You're not ashamed of the gospel. Amen. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Because Jesus suffered, he shed his blood, he died, he was buried and resurrected after three days. Because of that, when we ask Jesus to save us from our sins, save us from the storms of life that will come, believe that he is the only way to heaven. We talked about Friday night. All roads don't get to the same place. There's only one boat you need to be in, and that's the one Jesus is the captain of. All the other ones are not going to the same place. So immediately you're saved, just like his disciples. So what's next? If you've done that, if you've done the ABC, admit, believe, confess, 
The next step is baptism. Baptism does not save you. The book of Hebrews talks about Noah and how Noah was saved from the water. Right? The ark carried them through. Jesus is that thing that carries us through. Just like this boat on the Sea of Galilee carried his disciples through. Jesus is the one who saves. We got to be in his boat. The next step is baptism. And that's acknowledging what God has done for you. Acknowledging that Jesus died, was buried, and resurrected. And that's what baptism symbolizes. It's a public confession of an inward condition. You're telling the world what's happened in your heart. You're telling the world that I've, I've got the life jacket on, and even though I go underwater, I'm not going to drown. Jesus saves us. Colossians 2.12 says, Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. If Jesus is in our boat, if we're wearing Jesus, Our future has a hope. Don't have the life jacket just sitting on the shelf. Make sure you put it on. Even when it's not real convenient. So Jesus, walking on the water is a picture of our salvation and how we need him in our boat. How we need him to save us. Without him, it's just a storm. Have you done that? Have you made the good confession? Not just saying a prayer. Maybe you went forward one time and you said the prayer because everyone else did. That's, that's not what salvation is about. Salvation is about it coming from right here and truly wanting Jesus in your boat to save you, putting on the life jacket. And if you've done that, if you've made the good confession, then live like you're saved. Get baptized. So how is Jesus walking on water a picture of salvation in your life? Have you made that good confession? It can be done so easily. If you're here or listening online, it's as simple as I said as ABC, admitting that you're a sinner. Simply by saying, Lord Jesus, forgive me, I'm a sinner. I believe that you're the Savior. I believe that you're the only one who can save this sinking boat. And I confess my sins to you and I choose to follow you. I choose to put you on and wear you for the rest of my life. It's as simple as that. And if you've made that confession, if you've asked Jesus to do that, then let somebody know. And the next step is baptism. Baptism is that public profession of an inward condition. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this picture that you have given us. How you are the Savior, how you have saved us. Lord, that we should put you on and wear you even when it's uncomfortable. Lord, we thank you for the promise of salvation that you have given us. We thank you for this picture of salvation that you have given us. We thank you for your plan of salvation. We thank you for the simplicity of this plan of salvation and 
Lord, may we take strength and power from that in our daily lives. May we leave here with our heads held high, glorifying the captain of the ship always every day and thanking you and praising you for the salvation that you give each one of us. Lord, we thank you and praise you and ask that you go before us for the rest of the the day and in the meeting to come and we give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So Dave and the worship team, if you would come forward and then when you're done, if you would pray for the food, Dave. Father God, I just thank you for this uh, reminder that even when the storm is raging, you're there with us closer, closer than we could ever imagine. I thank you for that, Jesus. I thank you that your love for us goes beyond our understanding. But as we talked about in Sunday school this morning, that how you love us unconditionally as your children. We thank you for that. Your love for those that don't know you yet is still dear. You want none to perish. All to come to the saving knowledge of you, Jesus, receiving you as Lord and Savior. I pray, Lord, as we uh, head next door, as we have that opportunity to to do the uh, the business of this church body, I pray, Lord, that you would uh, bless the food, those that are there, and uh, Lord, just make it be a time of, of good fellowship knowing that you're G- you, Jesus, are the one that is the captain of our ship. We just love you, Jesus. What will be all about you? We pray these things in your name and all God's people said. Amen. See you next door.